Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending today's Qualcomm Advantage Network membercast, featuring the topic of retail payment trends and innovations. It's wonderful to see you all here today since our last event in May. My name is Oksana Wilcox, and I will be your moderator today. So before we get started, I'd like to go over just a few quick housekeeping rules to help us all better participate in today's event. At the bottom of a the screen, there is a toolbar with multiple applications that you can use. All of those widgets are resizable and movable, so please feel free to customize your experience on the desktop space as you need. You can expand the slide area if you still want to see more and maximize it to the full screen by clicking at the top arrow on the top right corner. If you have any questions about technical issues with the event or questions to the speakers or questions to the subject matter experts, please, we encourage you to utilize the Qualcomm, um, the Q&A widget in time during the presentation. We will try to answer as many questions as we can at the end of the webcast. Today, we have a very exciting event scheduled for you for 60 minutes. However, we will try our best to finish five minutes before to give you an opportunity to complete a very short survey to share your opinion about the event and ways to improve with us. We very much value your opinion. As I said, we have a very exciting agenda for you today. First, we will start with our marketing leader for the IoT marketing team talking to you about marketing campaign focus and opportunities to participate for our partners. Then we'll move on to our subject matter expert, Kate Gundy, who will discuss the reimagining of retail, digital transformation of payments, and set up our topic for the rest of the conversation. Later on, Kato will moderate a very exciting panel of innovative leaders, thought leaders, and industry experts discussing retail payments, trends, and innovations. We have speakers coming from wonderful companies like Global Payments, HP, Royal Bank of Canada, and ELO Solutions. We will finish up with a Q&A and give you five minutes, as I said earlier, to complete the survey. First and foremost, let me give you a quick update what we've been up to since the last event for some of those of you who have participated. Hopefully, you have been enjoying our quarterly member news that highlight our partners' commercial success stories, upcoming event announcements, and provide tips on how to maximize your QAM membership. Since our last event in May, we continued to enhance partner products and services recommendations on Qualcomm.com. We understand that discoverability and relevant product and service recommendations is key to making informed business decisions. So in early October, we will be launching a new feature called Member Offerings Directory, which is a centralized repository where customers can easily find partner products and services to help them go to market faster. I'll give you a little preview of that on the next slide. From a program ease of use perspective, we have updated the program application journey to offer a more guided program experience and most importantly, to speed up the approval process. So please encourage your team members, your other folks on your teams to take advantage of that and join and experience our new application journey. This is a very quick slide. I uh, just wanted to share with you some of the visuals for how we continue to accelerate partner promotion for awareness and demand generation. At this point, our next speaker will talk to you about this wonderful co-marketing partner promotional opportunities and share examples and ways to engage. So how would you like to learn about Qualcomm IoT marketing campaigns for the next 12 months? Susan Palazzotto is the Staff Manager of Product Marketing and the IoT Marketing Lead here at Qualcomm. I know some of you had an opportunity to work with Susan on a number of campaigns. In this segment, Susan will share with you the IoT Business Unit Marketing Campaign Focus and opportunities for partners to engage with us. Go ahead, Susan. Thank you, Oksana. As um, she mentioned, my name is Susan Palazzato, and I am one of the marketing leads in our IoT marketing group. And I'm here today to share with you some marketing campaigns that uh, we believe that we love to see our uh, partners potentially co do some co-marketing with us. We For the next 12 months, each quarter, we focus on specific segments or industries for our marketing campaigns. 
In October through December, as you can see, we were focusing on retail, specifically in payments and biometrics. And then moving on to the next quarter, we have transportation on uh, focusing on tracking and logistics. And then in April and June, we are focusing on manufacturing, specifically like the industrial and automation um, aspects. And then the last quarter we have here is building safety and security in the enterprise segment. And you're probably wondering, you know, what this looks like and how you all can help us um, with these marketing campaigns. Here what you see is our example of the quarterly campaigns that we had the previous 12 to um, 15 months or 16 months. And we focused on healthcare and fitness, we had education, we had retail last year, we had energy and supply chain. And what we do is we look at all the various Qualcomm technologies that fit into that particular focus or segment. And we love to be able to have use cases to help showcase and explain how our Qualcomm technologies are making an impact, making a difference um, for these particular segments. So if you're interested, um, in potentially participating with us, please email us um, at the email you see here and describe which Qualcomm technology that you're working with, which segment or quarter that you'd like to be um, considered for, and we can have a conversation to see how you can help us and we can help you with some co-marketing activities. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Cato Gandhi, who is the Global Lead for Retail Payments and Signage. Hello everyone, my name is Ketel Gandhi and I lead retail IoT payments and digital signage segment business at Qualcomm. I'm very excited to share the trends of this growing segment with all of you. Thank you, Susan. Let's start from the very beginning. Here is a timeline of how technology across payments have permeated through the decades. We started with cash transactions and that's still being used. Then there were checks, but now the predominant method is credit and de uh, debit cards, uh, which we call the digital payments. Currently, we are experiencing an exciting period of innovation in payments as more payment modalities are emerging on top of these digital credit and debit card payments. During pandemic, QR code and in-app payment saw significant growth. Now a significant number of consumers use their mobile wallets to make payments, not just through e-commerce or in-app, but also in the stores. In addition, biometrics and digital crypto payments are other emerging technologies. Now these payment experiences go hand in hand with enhancements in shopping modalities. Gone are the days when the only option to check out from the store was to stand in a long multi-lane checkout line. Now there are options for consumers. Online deliveries and buy online pickup in store grew significantly during pandemic. However, consumers seems to be coming back to stores post-pandemic. Their expectations have changed though. They want instant gratification and retailers are responding by having multiple options and multiple modalities, such as scan, pay and go, self-checkout, frictionless checkout, endless aisles, smart carts, line bustings, and so on. So with these shopping modalities and payment modalities evolution, there has been an evolution of devices form factor and functionalities. Also, there have been a tremendous growth in shipments of these dedicated payment devices. This is primarily driven by the switch from the more traditional swipe or the card swipe modality to chip and contactless payments. There has been growth in the payment or the point of sale architecture from it being a more legacy uh, PC-based architecture to more modern 
mobile android based architecture there has been a trend of integration of point of sale and payment function into one device and there are new features that are being added such as biometrics while qualcomm has been beneficiary of this growth it would not have been possible without the support of our excellent ecosystem partners we have ready to go reference designs and smart modules based on qualcomm technologies from our partners which helps reduce significant time to market for our customers and while we have been working with our odm and oem customers for designing and developing dedicated payment devices we are also seeing an increasing trend of payment functionality moving to other devices as well there has also been a trend of consumer devices interacting with the iot devices or the dedicated enterprise devices in the physical environment to support this transition we are now interacting with the broader payment ecosystem our vision is to secure payment acceptance on all devices this is a typical payment processing cycle and there are many organizations in the ecosystem such as bank payment processor card networks merchants and of course consumers so our goal is to work with all of these partners make them part of our ecosystem and continue to enrich our existing and future ecosystem partners thank you so much for your time today to allow me to share our retail iot vision and our payments vision there is such a large opportunity for reimagining retail experiences and virtually all of these retail iot experiences start with qualcomm we are very proud of our innovations we are leading with our ecosystem for retail and payments to ultimately create more rewarding and relevant experiences for retailers for store associates and for customers and brands globally thank you welcome again dear ecosystem partners and panelists uh, once again i'm ketal gandhi and i will be moderating this exciting panel Today we are going to discuss retail payments and point of sale trends and innovations. As someone who is living and breathing payments innovations every day, I'll tell you there is a lot of exciting opportunities in this industry to improve customer experiences, to enhance security and to enable efficiencies for everyone in the ecosystem. Speaking of the ecosystem, we have an excellent panelist today. from all parts of the value chain from a bank and a payment processor to device oem and solution provider who will share their perspective not only based on their current roles in the ecosystem but their many years of experience in the field i have the pleasure of knowing most of these panelists personally for several years now and they all have one thing in common they are thought leaders in their areas of expertise and they contribute to their organization's growth with their passion of innovation and execution let me start by introducing ayudu osei ayudu also goes by ao is a senior vice president of product innovation product and innovation at global payments uh, in this role he heads targeted growth strategy strategy initiatives involving long term business and innovation topics for the chief strategy officer of global payments merchant solution prior to joining global ao has held multiple roles in product and business development at qualcomm intel and bank of america ao off to you uh, if you don't mind please introduce yourself more and your company Yes, absolutely. Thanks for having me, Keto. It's a pleasure to be with you guys this morning. Um, I've been with Global Payments for five years, uh, and uh, I reside in 
Atlanta, which where we are headquartered. It's just an incredible uh, opportunity to be working for a, such a, a powerful company. Global Payments is one of the largest payment processors in the world with uh, over 25,000 employees uh, doing business in over 100 company, uh, countries globally. Um, you can think of us as a payment technology company, not just payment processing, because we do uh, it, get involved in a number of solutions that go up and down the payment stack on the merchant side. We have uh, issuing technology in which we work with banks and credit card uh, processors as well and credit card issuers. So um, it's really an exciting time to be at Global and it's an exciting time to be talking about payments with you guys today. Thank you, excellent. Uh, next panelist is Chris Renzos. He manages ISV business development uh, for EMEA region at ELO Touch. And Chris is a, a payments industry veteran. Uh, within ELO right now, he's focusing on uh, merging the previous knowledge gain uh, in order to empower the commercial team with strong partner ecosystem. Um, all in, uh, he's, he's focusing on all-in-one interactive devices that include payments, uh, especially on the mobility range and, fix, uh, and fixed tails, and also kiosk uh, uh, that ELO provides. Um, he's more concentrated on the Android and NFC elements to enable soft POS and pin on glass technology, which is a topic we will be talking about in the panel. Uh, Chris, off to you. Uh, please introduce yourself and your company. Thank you, uh, Kel. I think you've already done quite a bit of introduction, so I'm going to try to shorten as much as possible from my side. But yeah, I've been working the last 20 years odd years as a partner manager, service delivery manager, and account manager within the QSR retail hospitality sector uh, in a lot of areas that you mentioned already, primarily focusing on anything to do with payment solutions combined with hardware and software. Uh, I was recently in WorldPay and now within ELO, uh, which is essentially a quite a pioneering company in uh, touchscreen technology within the last 50 odd years. Uh, worth of experience and a global presence at the moment. We do specialize quite a bit in direct solutions with a lot of different sectors like the ones I mentioned earlier, obviously retail, hospitality, quick service and logistics and so on. Uh, there's a lot of focus on reliability, so the failure rates are really low. And within the last years, uh, we've been very much focusing, and you, as you mentioned, onto a lot of Android focused devices that provide this all-in-one capability of having the payments enabled within them. May that be a handheld device or it could be uh, tills or kiosks. We're very much focused into providing that sort of experience. Great. Uh, thanks, Chris. Our next panelist is uh, Manuel Rogero. He's a director of emerging technology and partnerships uh, at the Innovation Group at Royal Bank of Canada. Uh, it has been a pleasure uh, working with Manuel very closely in the last couple of years, and I'm blown away with his knowledge, his positive outlook, and his persistence. Uh, Manuel, uh, please introduce yourself further and also your company. Uh, thank you, Cato. Um, so, yes, I work for an area within the bank that is called Solution Acceleration and Innovation. Uh, RBC takes a distributed approach to innovation, which is quite unique for a financial institution. So we have multiple innovation labs working with each other and as well as the lines of businesses to bring cutting edge solutions to the future of financial services, right? On the personal side, uh, you know, I love action sports. I had the luck to be born in Peru where uh, waves are constant year round. So that got me into surfing at a very early age. And maybe that's what helps me fit in with innovation roles. I'm definitely not risk averse. Um, about RBC, you know, it's the 11th largest bank globally, $130 billion market cap approx. Uh, that's, you know, people don't really understand, but that's 40% larger than Citibank's market cap today. We have about 13 million personal and small business customers. Um, and it, RBC is also the main private institution that invests in AI annually within Canada. One of the other innovation groups we have is called Borealis, and they're leading the, the pack 
in AI algorithms and constructs that then other innovation units within the bank can leverage. That's great. Thank you, Manuel. Uh, and last, not but uh, last but not the least, I would like to introduce to uh, you to Sandeep Kamal global strategist from HP, working in retail and industry solutions group. Uh, Sandeep, uh, please go ahead and introduce yourself and your company. Sure, yeah, hi Ketal, and uh, hello to my fellow panelists. Uh, great to be here with all of you, and uh, hi everyone who is watching this. My name is Sandeep, uh, so as Ketal said, I'm with HP, working here as a global strategist. Uh, our group within HP, HP is a large company. Our group is called Retail and Industry Solutions, RIS for short. And we do a uh, variety of uh, retail products, which we'll talk about in a second. But over the last 25 years, I've worked for companies like Motorola, which became Google, uh, Mozilla, which was doing Firefox OS platform, not the browser, the mobile OS platform and then HP. So mostly I've been on the technology side uh, I, I'm all of my career actually. So smartphones all the way from 2G to 5G now, uh, tablets, uh, computing, and most recently in retail, uh, edge technologies and point of, uh, you know, point of sale and end-to-end -end inventory management and what have you. So really I get excited with new technologies that you know make meaningful impact on, on regular people. Uh, now, coming to HP, HP hopefully doesn't need any introduction. It's a well-known global brand, and uh, we are very well-known in consumer laptops and workstation, but also in you know enterprise verticals like retail, hospitality, and healthcare. And the brand, uh, you know, uh, in retail is pretty big as well. Uh, a lot of people are not aware HP is actually the number one point of sale, uh, you know, market share-wise as per IHL for for a while now, more than a couple years. And uh, the reason we are doing so well, which I believe is because of our great designs, we are known for our great aesthetic design that are built for the retail environment. We don't toss, you know, general purpose compute at retail. Uh, we actually build it ground up uh, based on what our customers need, the harsh retail environments, the long life cycles, you know, uh, lots of peripheral support um, and IT security. We are very careful about data and privacy. We we are a very channel friendly company, um, so people have the choice of going with their payment solutions or their point of sale solutions, and that keeps us going. Uh, we have done point of sale, modular hardware, as I mentioned, lots of end to end solutions as well. And I'm really excited to be here because payments is a great part of that experience. That's that's excellent. And uh, one uh, one fun fact I would like to share about Sandeep is that he writes about technology in his regional language in a in a regional newspaper. Uh, I think we we both share the passion of preserving our regional language. So uh, uh, this is uh, uh, this is a great uh, uh, initiative, Sandeep. Thanks for doing this. Um, and actually, uh, I'll start the first topic of discussion with you, Sandeep. Um, as a global strategist in retail, you must have to constantly keep yourself abreast of the new trends. What are your observations regarding evolution of in-store shopping experiences uh, from shopping and checkout modalities perspective? How has uh, COVID also impacted those uh, uh, trends? Yep, that's uh, that's a great question to start with, uh, Ketal. We we uh, at HP we do have a vantage point. Uh, we are fortunate that we get to talk to global customers and partners around the world every day. And um, as we know, retail has been under transformation for a while now, right? But especially in the last couple of years, uh, it has been phenomenal. I mean, it, that's an understatement. Uh, even before the pandemic, if you talk to any retailer, they will typically tell you two things that matter to them. One is the operational efficiencies and another is shopper experience. I mean, they talk about a lot of things, but really those two buckets is where it all uh, comes down to. And operational efficiencies, um, you know, on top of that, the global pandemic uh, made it a matter of health and safety for customers, for shoppers, for the associates that are walking in those doors, right? And many, many uh, use cases got introduced just in the last couple of years. They existed before, but the trajectory was like a hockey stick. And there are many examples of that, which we you know, had known before that. Uh, Boris, Bopis, buy online pickup in store, buy online return in store, uh, curbside pickup, 
self checkouts, uh, you know, drive throughs or click and collect and so on. And the key thing is normally the way retail notoriously moves slow, right? It, it would have taken months or maybe years, but uh, literally that had to happen overnight. And there are, you know, many examples like uh, Verizon had to uh, introduce their touchless retail, Michael's stores here in the US, they launched same day delivery or, you know, Ulta Beauty did this digital discovery of their products or Lowe's actually started this uh, video chat for their pro consumers and so on. Uh, so almost an overnight, uh, you know, transformation. And now that, you know, uh, COVID has been, you asked about COVID, it's like um, we have an inside joke here that COVID was the chief innovation officer for the retail world. It really changed everything in a, in a matter of a couple of years. But as a result, uh, as we gratefully come out of this pandemic, there is a foundation now that we can build on, right? People are familiar with it. There are technologies in place and um, very highly personalized immersive experiences are possible now, including payments, including secure uh, shopping. Uh, for example, you know, in, just in the US, 80% of the people got introduced to contactless payment just in the last year. That's a huge number. It's not a full penetration yet, but at least the familiarity is there. Uh, so I'm really excited about this whole area. Uh, you know, unfortunately, COVID wasn't a good thing overall, but the technologies uh, did get a big push. That's that's great. I think we are seeing the similar um, perspectives from all around the ecosystem in the industry, including from the retailers. And um, one of the things to notice over here is because of these emerging shopping modalities and checkout modalities uh, and, and this expectation from customers to have this great experiences coming from the online now back into the store, uh, we are seeing a great um, uh, explosion of number of IoT devices that are installed in the stores. So that's another you know, implication of this. Uh, I would like to open uh, this question, the, the same question to any other panelist if they want to share their uh, thought on this topic before we move on to the next one. Yeah, I think uh, Sandeep did a, a fantastic job of just talking about the acceleration that we're seeing in, uh, in payments. Um, we have a division here at Global that's focused on the QSR space and the fast casual space, and we just saw so much tremendous desire for innovation. And whether they're, we're talking enterprise brands that we all know and love or local mom and pop shop, everyone was thriving and really looking for, you know, how can technology make my life easier? And in addition to the, the impact of COVID on customer experience and the need to have these different methods of transacting, the operational efficiency piece can't be understated because we're in a labor crunch that we haven't seen in a very long time. So really businesses have to think about like, how am I gonna deliver this great customer experience with less staff and maybe more reliance on automation and, and digitization. So it's just been a tremendous time to uh, to kind of see all of these technologies come together and, and transform businesses. Yes, uh, that's great, Ao. And and uh, I want to uh, dovetail on your response over there. And what, what would be interesting to hear is how are these uh, customer experiences, the shopping and checkout experiences, uh, making uh, the impact on payment methods. What are you seeing as a payment processor, one of the biggest payment processor in US? Uh, how, how is your company innovating to address this evolution of payments, which is happening because of this evolution in checkout experiences? Well, I think, um... You know, I, I've had the benefit of being in payments for a very long time, looking at a number of different schemes, local schemes, you know, uh, the, the big card schemes that are international, different networks, and different modes of, of transacting. And uh, it really is hard to, to do better than uh, the tap uh, transaction that we're seeing right now with Apple Pay, Google Pay, Samsung Pay, et cetera. That NFC tap and the adaption and the customer behaviors around that have just gone through the roof for a lot of the reasons that we've already stated. <clears throat> um, the thing that I'm really excited about um, as a recent partner that was announced for Mercedes-Benz Stadium here in Atlanta is the changing modality that we're talking about, mostly in a retail context, but also in an experiential context 
as so much consumer spend has gone into experience categories, you know, so the, the nature of traditional shopping and commerce has changed. The way that people want to consume uh, live events has also changed as well. So we're starting to push the envelope on not only thinking about one modality, it's really about providing all of the modalities that consumers want to to uh, to interact with. So in, in traditional sports, it could be, you know, a belly up concession stand or a kiosk or mobile ordering. And right now we're starting to have, whether it's a retailer, restaurateur or venue operator saying, hey, I want to make all of them available because consumers now uh, are accustomed to choice. You have different con consumer personas that are in your establishment with different needs at different times, and they may be part of different shopping journeys. So really the complexity is providing the payment methods, whether it be you know traditional card, account to account, buy now, pay later, you know, eventually, you know, we'll be talking about crypto and other blockchain backed uh, types of uh, transaction modalities as well. All of these things are going to be part of the mix. And really, it's our job to make that complexity simple for merchants and for consumers. So really, it's about um, I think Larry Page was famously said that if, if people want to pay in goats, we should let them pay in goats. <laughs> And, uh, you know, we have very much have that philosophy, which is about choice. And today we support over 140 different, uh, you know, um, alternative payment methods. And we just see that list continuing to grow, whether it be consumer wallet or, you know, a Venmo or a cash app or, you know, just wanting to pay directly through your bank account, you know, in, in the context of open banking. So. There's just so much opportunity to enable consumers to to make these choices and then allow merchants to make the best decisions for their operations as well. OK, that, so uh, it, the summary is it's all about giving choices to your customers, making it simple. There is a lot of complexity that comes with choices, but it's up to the organization to make it simple and up to the technology providers to have uh, a different ways to ha on how to simplify it for the consumers. Uh, excellent. Um, uh, Chris, you come from the payment processing company and now you are with ELO. Um, you know, they say ELO is everywhere. That's their tagline. And and I, I, I experience that. Now I go everywhere. I notice ELO devices, <laughs> including our own cafeteria. Um, so ELO devices are one of the first point of interactions for customers when checking out or checking in into the retail environment. Uh, what new innovative features are your customers looking for uh, that would improve that checkout and payment process, uh, both from the hardware and the software perspective? Uh, what, what are those features uh, that are commonly asked for? Yeah, I mean, following from what the uh, fellow panelists have been mentioning so far, and obviously, as globally we're coming out of the uh, COVID and everything else, and other factors associated to trying to lower the total cost of ownership uh, for every customers out there, I think a lot of important key messages have been explained. From our side, uh, we're equally focused quite a bit on providing this sort of all-in-one devices that are absolutely key now. Uh, for instance, Android handheld devices that are very much focused on things like mobile point of sale, that includes obviously the payment capabilities connected to them is absolutely on the rise. Um, may that be with just NFC on a hardened phone or NFC with a card entry and swipe. Um, we all want to be in position to give as many choices we can from what we provide. So. It's it's basically the whole logic of not having a chip and pin device anymore. If we can help it, just have everything in one. And with that, you have less things to break, less things to charge. The total cost of ownership goes down, again, as mentioned, for the implementation, the service delivery, a lot of different factors that come into all of this. So we are very keen into focusing on these devices. May that be with softballs or the traditional sort of certification methods that needed throughout and cooperating with payment service providers. Um, I think it's uh, it's the way forward. The way these devices can also be placed into docking stations and can become tills or kiosks. Uh, the fact that we're also focusing on separate kiosks to place uh, chip and pin 
uh, let's say, related sort of functionality or having that sort of pin on glass capability by having uh, an NFC or uh, accommodating the right sort of uh, device within it. There's a lot of different options we can provide to give as much choice to the end customer from a customer journey, but also from, of course, from the a lot of big enterprise and mid-tier uh, partners out there um, and, and, and respectively their customers to give that choice depending on what way they, they, that would happen. So I guess I will end with the fact that from an ELO perspective, we are very keen into having a very uh, diversified but quite focused at the same time range on that sort of logic. But also we can customize things respectively to what, uh, what's out there in order to cater for all these omni-channel journeys that we see are pretty much exploding as, as mentioned. Um, so yeah. Uh, we, the future is quite bright and not only QSR and hospitality, but uh, quite a lot of different other sectors altogether. And can I comment on on Chris's um, on Chris's response? Because something really resonated with me, Chris. You know, total cost of ownership. You know, sometimes we look at the uh, upfront cost of of buying a device, but truly integrating that into our systems uh, is 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 never really a known cost up front. So I think that's the right way to go. Um, you know, we need to support our merchants today. Um, they're under a lot of pressure. Um, and hopefully, you know, we don't go into a recession 2023. But due to due to COVID, I think many, many bought high stock of inventories. Um, and they need, you know, to reduce operational costs in general. And that's one of the journeys that uh, RBZ is in. How do we support our local merchants, how do we provide them great technology um, at a reasonable cost so that then we can service them better with other financial products? So, you know, partnering with companies like ELO, like Qualcomm makes a lot of sense to us, but that total cost of ownership is, is ultra important to really understand and deliver value to the merchants today. So all in all, if I have to summarize, I would say uh, retailers want uh, more for less. So all in one devices, more features, payments integrated with mobile compute and uh, productivity, but still keeping the total cost of ownership in control. And, and that's, um, uh, that's expected because they do have to cater to different types of customers like AO was mentioning. And, uh, you know, having different modalities and having different uh, experiences, uh, enabling those, uh, you know, cost money. So they have to make sure that they get that efficiency in the technologies and the devices and the software that they choose. Um, so this is uh, this is great. Now, the, the uh, you know, Manuel, you were talking about cost of ownership. RBC is one of the biggest issuing bank of Canada and um, they also do, uh, you, uh, RBC also does payment processing to Moneris. Uh, issuing bank is typically the one who assumes the most risk in payment fraud and chargebacks, especially for card present transaction that happen in stores. Uh, and, and of course, cost is associated with this risk, right? So how do you see this risk evolving as more payment and checkout options are offered to consumers. So what steps does the bank take to mitigate these risks? Uh, can you share more about the security technologies that are being considered? Yes, yeah, so we we see the proliferation of endpoints and potentially through IoT, there's definitely is a risk, especially for identity management. As, 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 as our chief cryptographer used to say, biometrics, can solve, can provide great use cases and ease of transaction. But if you manage that data incorrectly, you begin to run out of body parts, right? So um, so one of the areas that we're definitely focused on uh, is cryptography. We're investing a lot in cryptography and hiring top talent. Uh, we see RBC as not only safeguarding customers' traditional physical assets, just as important as this, as these assets, is their data, right? So we see us positioning ourselves heavily in managing our, our customers' data safely and securely. So the three areas of technology 
we're investing in to do this, like I mentioned before, is cryptography, federated data, and we're looking into quantum security as well because quantum security has the potential to break any cryptographic uh, construct. So we're also looking to see how we pose ourselves or we prepare ourselves for the advent of quantum computing. So those would be the three technologies you know, we're really looking into, uh, but it's all around the data management and identity management and not losing that identity for our customers within payments, which will evolve and we're going to talk about this later into embedded financial services through new distribution channels, such as Internet of Things. That's great. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that uh, banks are taking these initiatives and looking into safeguarding the data. Uh, I would personally, I would be um, uh, trusting the bank more with my data than a social media company. So, yeah. so thanks for doing that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now the last, uh, uh, or maybe if we have time, we, we can do two more questions, but um, uh, which of the following payment trends are you most bullish about? So this is the question for all my panelists. And, and uh, why are you bullish about that payment trend? Um, and then, uh, so the, the things that I had in mind was soft POS, Chris mentioned uh, soft POS, uh, Manuel uh, mentioned crypto and digital currency. Uh, we talked about biometrics, and then there is this concept of IoT payments. So these are some of the trends that I'm seeing. Uh, you are welcome to add any other trends that I have missed. Of course, contactless is not a trend. I would say it's today, it's already happening. Uh, and um, that adoption is taking up a uh, big time, but this is more futuristic trend. So um, AO, we can start with you. Uh, 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 please uh, give your insight into any of these trends and uh, anything else you would like to add on the trends. Well, just based on my background, I'm really excited to see what's happening with IoT payments. But the trend that I'm spending most of my time on right now is biometrics because I think it truly has the capability of improving and removing friction from so many different points, particularly when we're talking in person. And the platforms and the, the IP providers that I'm seeing now have just advanced so, so rapidly over the last five years over where things were, both in terms of accuracy, in terms of caretaking around the data, models that are really sensitive to enterprise privacy officers uh, concerns. So I think we've thought through kind of the entire life cycle of the data. It doesn't mean that there aren't risks and there, there probably are opportunities for, for bad actors in this context, but I am seeing quite an advance in the practical scalable solutions around biometrics, whether that be combined with access management. I mentioned kind of a stadium context earlier. Uh, or whether that is actually around payments and pay by face or pay by palm or whatever the uh, the modality is. Um, and I think the opportunity, as uh, Manuel mentioned, around what that means for embedded finance and new channels, I think is tremendous because there's just so much friction that still needs to be taken out of the system. I think biometrics has tremendous potential still untapped. Yeah. And um, I, I totally concur on that uh, biometrics trend. Um, one of the uh, misconceptions that people have is like biometrics. Uh, if, if the biometrics database is hacked, you know, you pretty much have to change your palm or face. So that's not the case. <laughs> you don't have to. In fact, if, a, if a, a database of password or credit card is hacked, actually the hackers can do something immediately with it, but uh, typically biometrics images are not shared or stored in a raw format. They are stored in a cryptographic templates, which you, even if a hacker gets access to it, they can't do much with it. You need the other side to actually decode that cryptographic uh, data. So it is, um, uh, it is quite safe uh, if it is done right. Of course, it has to be done right. Um, Chris, what 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 is uh, uh, what are you most bullish about uh, from all of these trends? 
Yeah, from my side and Ilo's side respectively, and I guess from Paco's side as well, we've seen a lot of interest in Android technology becoming quite key for contactless related applications and uh, scenarios out there. So Sophos, Sophos for me is absolutely key. May that be again, coming out of the pandemic, um, various different factors that came up. So for instance, in Germany it used to be 50% cash, right? Before the pandemic, after the pandemic, it has exponentially increased to use contactless and but in general, it has, contact list has been something that uh, I guess, especially more in Europe, but globally, and obviously in APAC, it's been a big thing. Um, we see a hell of a lot of interest in a lot of different applications for, for Sophos, and it is new. Uh, it's something that um, still has to be, let's say, fully standardized out in the field, but not. There are waivers out there that are fully uh, available to use and so on. There's a lot of uh, uh, mixed, perhaps, information about it, but it, it definitely for me, I can see it being the future. There's so much interest out in the industry from ISVs and, of course, the payment service provider side to proceeding those sort of rails, payment rails, should we say. And uh, yeah, I, I can definitely see it uh, being quite uh, interest for the future, for the near future, at the very least, and, uh, and biometrics also uh, as part of it, as mentioned by earlier. Yeah. Yeah, so Sophos, uh, for those of you who, who may not be familiar with that term, it's basically an ability to uh, accept contactless payment on any off-the-shelf commercial device. Uh, uh, and, and in this case, it's the Android device that Chris was referring to. So it could be your mobile phone. It could be an enterprise uh, uh, pro mobile productivity device. But you don't need any dongles or any uh, additional hardware and it's a purely software-based solution, which which I think it's it's uh, quite revolutionary for uh, many different use cases. Um, uh, Manuel, what about you? What what thoughts do you have on on the payments trends that you're most bullish about? So I have a clear pick here, which is number four, or at least on, on the uh, the guide, which is IoT payments, right? So. Just wanted to make a comment about crypto and digital currencies. These might become funding mechanisms for payments in the future. Uh, and I see people adopting these, but these are funding mechanisms, right? They're not necessarily a, a distribution channel or a method to accept payments, right? Um, I would like to concentrate more on IoT payments because this is very dear and near to my heart. Uh, payments is the starting point for value-added services in this new era of hyper-connectivity. From a business perspective, the bandwidth that 5G brings to connectivity, this is the key, right? This will make marginal cost of integrating any device into a network trend towards zero, right? That's what we see 5G pushing, and that's why we looked eventually for to talk to Qualcomm to begin building these new constructs. Um, so in essence, there will be a day where most everything will be connected at least, or at least enabled to be connected, right? Like we like to joke around, even your toaster will be connected. Um, but what does hyperconnectivity bring to the table? Data, right? So companies that can successfully leverage this data safely and securely to create valuable ecosystems will create a competitive advantage for themselves. So let's bring this back to financial services. We believe that IoT is the perfect delivery channel for embedded financial services. Some examples, okay? Connected cars. Cars are one of the main assets consumers possess, right? And with connectivity, cars will become an important digital channel to connect with their owners in real time. In certain instances, maybe even as or more pertinent than a smartphone, right? You have these huge digital dashboards on the car and I believe car manufacturers are also questioning themselves that they can bring in a lot more value aside than just Apple car and Android car, right? They can really leverage this internal dashboard to create differentiators for their automobiles. Right? Another one that I like to talk about is connected industry, right? There's already a rollout of 5G, of private 5G networks within factories, right? A simple but not so evident use case that I like to talk about is the preventive versus corrective machine maintenance. Today, this mostly depends on a person being able to track the state of a machine and solicit servicing for preventive maintenance. 
But this fails because sometimes a human just forgets to put in the request for that preventive maintenance. Would it not be more efficient to provide a company, a virtual CFO, right? Where each machine holds its own digital wallet. The CFO can preload balance to each wallet. And then that machine can order its own parts and service to avoid breakdown and a more expensive corrective maintenance down the road. So we are seeing a lot of opportunity through IoT to deliver new financial, em embedded financial models to multiple industries, right? And this is ultra exciting for us because this can expand the level of services and the quality of services and even possibly dynamic you know, APR models for our clients, depending on how well their business is doing, because our loan officers would be able to get and gather real-time information on the production of businesses, the state of cars for second second hard car sales, car loans, et cetera. So there's a, a whole there's a fire hose of information you know, coming through. The difficulty will be how do we safely use that information and what standards will exist for us to leverage that information across an ecosystem and bring the right partners in. That's, that's great insights, uh, Manuel. Thank you so much. And thanks for bringing 5G into the discussion. There can't be any discussion at Qualcomm without the mention of 5G. So thanks for doing that. <laughs> and and Sandeep, uh, uh, now up to you. Yeah, I, uh, I agree with several points that were mentioned. And, uh, you know, for me, it's not a cop out answer, but I, I would say all of the above. Uh, really, simply because, you know, uh, there are four things I believe that matter for any technology, but especially for payments, uh, you know, cho choice, convenience, <laughs> privacy and security. I think the first two choice and convenience, we are completely at the mercy of the, the shopper and uh, the customer for us, it's the retailers. So they will decide what options they want to keep, uh, what's convenient for them. And, you know, a variety of people have different uh, preferences for what's convenient. But privacy and security is something our responsibility. Like the panelists here, that, that's what we need to own as the industry to make sure that these things stick. So uh, I think I, you know, as uh, earlier it was mentioned, at retail is all about, you know, reducing friction, right? Reducing friction and while making the shopper experience better and making payment seamless can, uh, you know, achieve these goals, both of these goals, right? So. Uh, even through uh, payment digitization, you know, even though it will continue with all of these ways, biometric and uh, digital wallets, uh, digital currency, merchant apps, you know, P2P payment, there are several ways now. But to answer your question a bit more directly at a personal level, I am bullish on biometrics. I know a couple of people mentioned that uh, simply because the technology uh, makes it as personal as it gets. It's my fingerprint on my body. Uh, it's as personal as it gets and it's as secure as it gets. There is no way to replicate this that, that easily. Uh, so if as an industry, uh, you know, if you execute that right, it can be really phenomenal, right? Already in places like India, as you know, Ketal, where we come from, UPI and Aadhaar, uh, biometric-based technologies, right? People are using their finger for almost, you know, majority of those uh, transactions that are happening through that for a billion plus population. It's it's trans It has transformed the country not only for... <coughs> People uh, in the country, whether you are literate or even illiterate, you have a finger and you can use that uh, biometric to get the money in your account. But also on the other side for financial institutions and for the government, for taxation, for streamlining finances, it has completely changed that. If you see the, the growth, the hockey stick of those adoption, that is through the roof, right? And that if we use that as a case study, it is possible to do that on a on a very short amount of time for a billion plus population. It it can be replicated very easily, uh, but again, uh, we have a responsibility as an industry to make sure this does you know get uh, respected for privacy, security, and that choice that AO mentioned earlier. Uh, that's really important. Absolutely, it is definitely our responsibility. Well said, Sandeep, and. Um, it is up to us and up to the industry to come up with the right security, right privacy protocols uh, to enable these. 
And uh, the other important thing that you mentioned is that this could enable financial inclusion, which is very important for the society. So uh, it, it, is, it will be done for the right reasons, I'm very sure. Um, in, in our group, our SVP uh, says IoT is a team sport. And because I work on payments, I said payment is even more of a team sport than IoT. Uh, so as you said, we all have to work together to get this done. Thank you so much for this discussion. This was very, very insightful for me, and I'm sure it is for our audience as well. Uh, this concludes our panel discussion. I'm so grateful to all of you for sharing your time, knowledge, and perspectives with our ecosystem partners. Um, thanks to everyone who is watching this webcast, and we look forward to hearing from you all. Uh, please share your feedback in the survey after the event. And uh, you can also directly reach out to me through LinkedIn if you have any questions, any comments, any feedback. Uh, very open to that. Uh, thank you once again, all the panelists. Uh, I'm, I'm super excited to start my day today because I get to spend the morning with you all. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, you Kato. Thank you for the great discussion, Kato and our esteemed guest panelists. As a reminder, if you have any questions related to the material or for any of the speakers, please do submit them at any time by using the Q&A feature of the interface. As we wrap up the event, I want to thank all attendees and the wonderful speakers and panelists. We know your time is valuable and we hope that you found our content interesting and insightful. Please do spend a few minutes completing a short survey before you disconnect. We very much value your opinion and suggestions for the next topics for our future member cast. On behalf of Qualcomm and our presenters, I thank you for joining us today and we look forward to seeing you in our new member casts very soon.